good morning today on skill cult today is just some updates and i'm just gonna ramble basically so if you don't like that don't watch it so check out the sign cool huh uh 42 fab richard uh, day made that and he had contacted me watches my channel he contacted me a while ago and he's like uh, i make uh, signs and fabricate metal and i think your logo would make a cool sign um i'm gonna make you one and send it and i was like cool great and it's so cool it's uh, three-dimensional it has the logo stands off of a white background which is really neat and it's weatherproof so i can put it outside in my little stu outdoor studio lecture area there very cool so thank you richard that is awesome and i got some other stuff to show you and uh what else i've been busy getting ready for winter and um we had these fires around here i'll talk about that in a minute and i had to tear my life apart when that happened and instead of just throwing everything back where it was, I was trying to reorganize my life a little bit and make it work better, which is just a good idea and something I never get around to. And as usual, I was trying to do that on an extremely low energy budget, very low lately, actually. I've hardly done anything lately. But for a while, the energy I did have, I put into that instead of I usually would use it, those little windows of energy to make videos. So I've been kind of slacking on getting videos out. Priorities, you know. So, uh, what else? Let's see. I've also been dealing with trying to get my equipment together. And I just last night bought the third camera in like a couple of months, maybe less than two months, trying to find something that'll work. And for like two years, I've been kind of limping along with this camera, trying to uh, make it work long enough for Sony or Fuji to put out the camera that I want and that lots and lots of other people want and are asking for, but they just will not put out. The only company that's put that out is Panasonic, but it's micro for third sensor, so it's like a half size of normal sensor, and that really screws up my whole lens scene and collection. So last night I bought a Panasonic G85 with a lens that costs more than the camera, which is a Voigtlander 17.5mm um, 0.95 millimeter, 0 .95, uh, aperture. Super, super fast. Um, because I need good low light performance. Basically my issue is that I can do good work with this camera, obviously, if you watch my videos, but I can't put on an external mic. I have a tons of problem with wind noise and I don't like wind noise in my videos, so I usually cut it out and then I have to like do my takes over. And I have like little fluffs of like fluffy stuff glued onto the top of the camera. Everyone always asks about that when they see my camera. They're like, what are those? fluffy things and that's to cover the the mics from the wind noise and so anyway i can't put an external mic on this camera because it doesn't have a jack it has poor low light performance that's a problem for me because i'm always running out in the woods i'm shooting uh, in the shade deep in the woods uh, when pushing the dark like a lot of times i'll run out in the evening and i'm trying to shoot something and it's getting dark and it's you know that's a real problem there's various other issues with this camera um, it overheats it has a short record time it records for 12 and a half minutes and then it starts a new file and it leaves a gap in between so i'll have these like awkward editing things i have to do the new camera i'm getting i think covers almost everything that i really need like the the basic set of stuff i need and then everything else on that is you know frosting on the cake but uh yeah it's hard to go down to a smaller sensor so this camera is one of them the fuji xt20 i just got that and i'm sending it back and i hate to send it back i really really wanted to switch to fuji i wanted fuji to save me from sony but you know they all have the same issues with like working their consumers and manipulating consumers like this is a stripped down version of a camera that costs quite a bit more and every company has like their flagship camera and then they have a stripped down version that they just leave a bunch of stuff out and some of that stuff they could easily put in but they're just you know they're just working you to get you to go buy up to the next model and like in this case the grip is way too small i i really i've heard people say they like the grip okay i have no idea how i don't even have large hands i have like you know medium at best and the I find this just grip unusable. So instead they sell a $128 piece of aluminum that goes on here to make the grip bigger. That's exactly the kind of reason um, stuff that makes me want to leave Sony in the first place. But uh, I'd much rather be with Fuji, but they just don't make the camera I want and neither does Sony, um, even though people keep asking for it. I mean, I've been, me and everyone else have been asking for this camera for a couple of years at least. 
This camera has actually been really great. Um, you know, for me, I, I started with an inexpensive camera and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get something that I can get by with until something comes out that I really can stand behind that is worth spending the money on. It's been really good, actually. This camera's been great, but it has some major issues and it costs me productive time. This is the issue. It's not about, like, I want the very best thing that does everything. It's about productivity and losing losing takes, you know, and losing shots over and over again due to all kinds of problems. So I just need a, a, a camera that's going to get out of my way. It's like, as they say, it's going to stay out of my way and let me do my work. Because I'm thinking about content, you know, all this, this stuff that I'm supposed to say and what order I'm supposed to say it in and all that stuff. I can't be worried about my equipment and sound and all that stuff on the top of it. So this camera, I'm hoping this is the one that will hold me over until I can really get what I want out of Fuji or Sony, preferably Fuji for sure. So everything else is going back. Uh, that's going back to Amazon tomorrow. Yeah, I haven't feeling that well, but I'm going to do this cool treatment um, using frog poison. I'm going to put, I'm going to poison myself with frog poison. So the story is, um, these guys in the Amazon have been using this poison frog medicine for a really long time. And what they do is the frog has no enemies because it's so poisonous that nothing messes with it. So you can just go out at night and listen for it. And then they go and catch the frog, take it to camp, um, tie it up basically. It looks like they're torturing the thing, but they're just trying to stress it to get it to release the poison. And then they, it's like catch and release. They just let it go after. It excretes this wax and this, this poison and they scrape the poison off and either use it fresh or dry it on a stick for later use. And you can get these sticks and, and use them. And the way it works is you can't eat it and you can't put it straight into your bloodstream, but they take a burning stick and just burn these little dots that burn off the top layer of skin and expose some capillaries. And then they, they you rub the poison and put these little dots of poison on top and it goes into your lymphatic system and eventually, you know, through your whole body. And it sounds very, very unpleasant. Uh, there's a lot of vomiting and diarrhea and sweating and people pass out and your heart races and, you know, people say it feels like you might die. So, and then it's over in like an hour. Why would I do that? Um, because a lot of people are helped with problems uh, similar to what I have. and. Uh, it's just fascinating to me, like these guys have been doing this for who knows how long, you know, since before recorded history or whatever, however you want to say that. They use it regularly. They they actually use it as almost like a tonic and they use it for hunting to uh, increase your um, sensory acuity, like hearing and sight and give more energy and stamina, kind of clear. It, people describe it as like a physical, mental reset where it just kind of clears you out and the person that I'm going to do it with that's going to show me how to do it has uh, been doing it and, like she does groups of people and stuff and she has someone with Lyme disease that is almost completely cured was on antibiotics for several years and was able to quit antibiotics right away you know there's just lots and lots of good stories now of course with these things you usually hear just the good stories but that's fine and those are the ones I'm interested in anyway I'm not even actually that interested in how many people it helps I would probably try it even if it's like you know 25 percent of people see any results at all but it's used for all kinds of broad um physical complaints and diseases by these people they use it as a tonic and like i said they use it for hunting i'm going to do that as soon as possible i'm actually really excited about it and i don't get that excited about treatments anymore because I'm just jaded after 20 years of trying all kinds of stuff, but my life's a total wreck, you know, I can't, it affects every aspect of my life having these problems, and um, like I can really emphasize how much that is true. So that's exciting, it's called Combo, K-M-B-O. I'll probably go get a couple of treatments from this acquaintance of mine and then take over and do it with uh, maybe one other person. Okay, enough of that. So uh, I got some stuff. People sent me stuff. Um, Steve Taylor made me a fro because he saw one of my videos where I was splitting stuff with whatever I had, like hatchets and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, I'm a blacksmith and he likes to make stuff. And he's like, I'll make you a fro. And I was like, that's awesome because I could have bought a fro many times 
for a long time, but I just never did because I just figured I'd just make one, right? Just make one. <laughs> and here it is, whatever, 30 years later, and I haven't made one yet. So that's cool. Um, he demonstrates blacksmithing in the gold country at parks, and um, yeah, nice guy. Thank you, thank you very much for that. And I just got this in the mail from Buckin' Billy Ray Smith, K.W. Erdman, who's one of my Patreon supporters and uh, just an all-around great guy. Um, he contacted Billy, Buck and Billy Ray Smith and me, and he said, I'm going to have Buck and Billy Ray make you an axe, because Buck and Billy Ray does that. He has, like, a room full of axe heads and chainsaws, crazy amounts, like a lifetime of collecting. And they're like, well, what would you want to to like move to next or what, what's your interest? And I'm like, well, probably a double bit, two and a half to three pounds, probably two and a half to two and three quarter pounds with a 28 to 29 inch handle. And that's what this is. This is a two and a half pound uh, Grand Spores. And I have one like this superficially that looks like this that I was actually gonna sell off just to fund other projects and stuff but it, it is actually quite a bit different than this this is very different like that axe would need major modification to work for me and this one i think i'm just going to walk out and it's going to work i can tell already <clears throat> that this is going to function really well for me the main differences are this radius right here is really high in the other axe which i don't like this actually looks perfect to me it's fairly flat um, but there's you know an obvious curvature here, but it's not extreme and that's actually what I like. Also the grind is entirely different. So the other one I have is extremely thick all the way from the edge up into the body into the eye here. If anyone remembers, I just did a video on axe grinds talking about different types and one of them was like having this really not curved this way but pretty flat across and then having a hollow directly behind the edge. And that's pretty close to what this is. Now, obviously all of these things exist on a spectrum, right? You, you can't always just classify everything into a specific group, but basically this is like that. Like I think there actually is a, just a slight bit of a hollow right here behind. It feels like it. I haven't really measured it or looked at it that close, but it feels like it. So yeah, this is actually pretty exciting. I have a feeling I'll be able to walk out and this is just gonna work. I imagine this actually belonged to someone who knew what they were doing because one side is a little bit blunt and the other side is definitely a little bit more acute. It's not gonna take very much uh, sharpening and filing to get this in chopping condition. The handle is cool. There's no pommel because he, want, he gave me a 28 inch handle which meant cutting off like a full size ax. I may build this up and make a pommel the reason being, like, I can I can adapt pretty well, and the chances that I'm going to let go of this are pretty slim. And also, it allows me to work closer to the bottom, which gives me more length if I want. So I'm going to just use it for a little while this way. But it doesn't allow me to do one thing that I do all the time. If you see me in videos with tools, I'm always playing with tools, like flipping them around and stuff like that. And that's not just me showing off, I actually do that all the time. Like every time I pick up a tool, I'm spinning it, I'm I'm moving my hand all over around the handle in different ways. And that's, uh, that's like a whole, that's another video, but I actually do that on purpose. And I can't help it now at this point, but I think it's extremely beneficial because it helps you understand the balance of your tool. You're constantly, you're constantly feeling out the balance of your tool and, the, and its limitations like how long it is and everything and it just makes you better at handling handling the tool when you're working and understanding it um, but one of the things I do a lot with a small axe is I drop it and I'll just slide my hand like this and then I'll, I'll let it the, the pommel catch it now I'm never holding my axe like this unless I'm actually using it to cut I'm either holding it here because it's so much easier and this is where the balance point is and I can manipulate the ax and get it where I want really fast. You can't do that this way because you're fighting all of this inertia. Or I'm letting it hang. That's what I mean, see? I'm letting it hang this way where I don't have to hold anything up and the, the pressure is straight down or I'm just setting it down on the ground and literally dragging it 
or just setting it down for a minute while I do something so I don't have to hold the weight up at all. One of the ways I do that is if I'm holding it or I was just using it, I just drop it and then I, I let my hand catch on the pommel. So that's the main thing I might miss. And obviously there's always a chance, always more of a chance that you're gonna lose control of the ax. Like in limbing, if you uh, miss something or go through a, a small limb too fast and you know the ax could pull, pull out of your hand. So it's nice to have a stop of some kind. But like I said, I've, I've used axes um, actually quite a bit with nothing here and, and it's perfectly possible to adapt and conform to that. Uh, again, it'll, it actually gives me an extra inch of working room. So not only is this a full 20, 28 inches, which is uncommon because most 28 inch handles are actually 27 inches, or even less by the time you half them up, the pommel takes up another inch or so that you can't use. So that's interesting. Anyway, I need to, to call Bucken and we're going to talk about this and I'm sure a bunch of other stuff. I've never talked to him in person before, but looking forward to it. Thank you very much, both of you, KW Erdman and Bucken Billy Ray Smith. And if you want an ax and you want something specific, you might check him out. Um, he does, you know, he does sell axes and he's got like a huge collection. So he might have what you're looking for. So I'm looking forward to that. I feel like I can learn something from this ax. Now I'm getting a couple other axes. Um, a guy just contacted me recently, Andre Meyer, and he's sending me a German ax and it's this real, tra I'll put up a picture of it. It's this real traditional, very specific, design of German axe. Um, it's very wedge shaped, which is interesting. It's got a, a very specific design and shape, which is also very interesting. It's obviously a traditional design. He says that they're used mostly in steep rocky ground for primarily spruce. It's a traditional design, which really interests me a lot. It's got the D-shaped eye, which I, I never would think that's something that I would want, um, but I'm just going to slap my ego into place and just use this tool because this is obviously a design that evolved. That doesn't mean that it's the best thing or anything. Sometimes traditions endure that make no sense, but I'm just gonna give it a shot and use it the way it is for a while before I start do any messing around with it. So that's really cool. And thank you so much, Andre, for sending that all the way from Europe. Very cool. So John Ugalde is also sending me an axe and he's sending me a Basque axe. And these axes are different in that the handle drops in from the top of the eye like some European axes and like a tomahawk for instance. And so as you use the axe it gets tighter instead of wanting to fly off because the thickest part of the handle is the top. So he's sending me one of those heads and he posts a lot of stuff on his channel about like Basque uh, axe competitions and it's real interesting because this is like a traditional design again. They have like a, a developed and vibrant axe culture still going and they their competitions are insane. I mean they're chopping through these huge beach logs like multiple beach logs sometimes as a single person sometimes as a team and then a lot of them after they finish cutting all the logs they have to run you know in a in sand <laughs> around this big arena or whatever they have different competitions they put together to really but they really 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 test people i mean they're hardcore there's also a really great video out there of a basque competition of two guys cutting the same car in half so they have two models of the same car and they're cutting it in half with axes it's awesome so check out uh, johnny valde's channel for any of that stuff my favorite video that he's put out um i haven't watched them all but my favorite one is an old old guy who's like 80 something chopping through a log and obviously you know obviously the guy doesn't have a lot of vitality and energy you know he's he's old but what he has is efficiency like super high efficiency using this axe and every blow counts and he's making that axe work a lot without expending a lot of energy that's a very good video to watch so thank you john for sending that i really like john a lot he's um you know he's always trying to foster conversations about actually using axes and not just collecting and restoring them and uh and uh, i feel kinship with him in that yeah so oh and <laughs> look at the packaging on the axe buck and billy ray smith sent me i think that's hilarious because <laughs> it looks like an axe Anyway, I've had people offer to send me other stuff and some of it I've refused and some of it I've accepted. I'm real hesitant to accept product from people. Um, I don't really want 
that and I'm not in this to get swag. I actually don't like a lot of stuff around. I have no interest in collecting just large quantities of axes. I'm interested in what I can learn from stuff. I wouldn't mind having a, a large representation of traditional axes because I, I might always want to revisit them or show them to someone or use them for educational purposes. So that interests me. But in terms of just like collecting a ton of axes for myself, I have no interest in that. If I can't use it or learn something from it, uh, I don't really want it. I'm sure people will keep offering to send me things. Um, and some of them I already have or I just don't need. I'll probably just, you know, politely decline. <clears throat> See, my camera just turned off. It, it recorded two files with a space in between and then it just shut off and I have to like turn it back on. The camera I'm getting that I just bought last night has unlimited recording time until it overheats. Way to go Panasonic. But Micro Four Thirds, it just doesn't work that well for me because I shoot a lot of vintage lenses and um, Micro Four Thirds is two times crop factor, so I put a 30 millimeter lens, you know, from like a, an old film camera, because I use mostly um, vintage manual focus primes, and mostly manual focus primes, not necessarily vintage. Now, if I put a 30 millimeter on my Micro Four Thirds camera from Panasonic, then it's a 60 millimeter, and if it was an F2, now it's an F4, and that just doesn't work for my low light needs and stuff like that. So yeah, I would actually like to see Panasonic start making cameras with larger sensors. What else? Axe pucks. Um, I've been accumulating axe pucks to try. The, here's three from Amazon, like the ones that are kind of generally available. It's uh, Marbles, Norton, and Lansky. I probably won't like any of them. Um, that wasn't the point. It's just to test everything that's out there. If I just look at it and say I'm not going to like that, which I know I'm not, um, almost almost now people won't really go for that they're gonna be like well you didn't test it you didn't try it like i get crap on my video for the um, husqvarna hatchet for not actually really like sharpening it up and really using it i don't need to i don't know why it's so hard for someone to believe that that someone could understand a tool well enough to feel like they don't they don't need to use it and and be right like what if you handed some ridiculous clunky poorly designed wrench to a mechanic you know and they were like no that this isn't this is no good you know will you be well you need to like you need to use it and bruise your knuckles for a couple of days to make sure for me you know to to prove it to me i got better things to do with my time thank you very much anyway i think i have about six seven i think i have about eight different ones i'm still looking into one more and then um i'll oh and then other ones in the mail from finland it's funny a guy in the comments he was like oh there's this finnish traditional finnish natural stone um you might want to try that and so i ordered one just recently he paypal'd me 15 bucks and he's like i don't want to be responsible if you don't like it <laughs> pretty funny so thanks that's that's really nice i, I appreciate the help because I don't want any of this stuff. I'm just buying it to test. The finish stone I'm real interested in, though, and I couldn't... I, I saw it, and I was like, if I'm really going to test Axe Bucks, and this is available, even if you have to order it from Europe, I just have to try that one. And so most of that stuff will probably get sold off when I'm done, because I don't, I don't really want it. We'll see, though. We'll see. The point is to kind of, like, look at everything on the market, see what's there, see what works the best, and what's the best value, and what's just n not worth it at all. Uh, I'm still waking up, honestly. And uh, that's about it. The leek seeds are still drying. Believe it or not, it's insane how long they take to dry. And a lot of hot weather. Like, it, I just had the first fire a few days ago, like two, three days ago, um, around November 2nd, I guess, something like that. Not only was it not raining and not cold and we didn't have any frost, I'm still not sure we've really had any significant frost. We were having 90 plus degree days um, and a lot of 80 plus degree days. Very weird, very weird weather. Oh, and the fires. I was going to bed one night and it was kind of, you know, late, like 9.30 or 10 or something. And I heard stuff hitting the roof. And I was like, why is stuff hitting the roof? And then I'm like, oh, wow, it's, it's really windy out. So we had these freak winds. It, there was no clouds, no storm, no lightning, no nothing. Just out of the blue, clear weather came these really strong, really high winds, and it was warm. And it had been um, really dry with a really low humidity for a while, and the fire people were saying, we're, we're it's extreme fire danger, this is the worst time of year right now because we've been having this low humidity. Until it rains, we're, you know, high alert. 
So this happened at night and then it kept blowing and it blew down a bunch of power lines. I don't even know how you prepare for that. Like how do you prepare for just randomly a bunch of power lines blowing down and starting electrical fires over a large area? <clears throat> you know, you really can't prepare for that. And since it happened at night, the fires just grew all night. And by morning, you know, people were already, people's places were already burned out. My ex-wife has a cottage on the property. She came down, you know, before dawn and woke me up and she said, there's fires all over the place. I went outside, it was smoky already, and there was like ash raining down out of the sky. I'm like, wow, that's ash. The fires were actually about, you know, five to eight miles from me, but real close to my mom's house. She was evacuated for like six days. Fortunately, she didn't get burned out. <clears throat> and we were just like, okay, well, this fire could turn and be here in 24 hours, you know, or even, even less, but probably 24 to 48 hours. So I spent about three hours packing all my, my most valuable stuff into the truck. And then I just burned out and crashed because I already wasn't feeling well. I managed, managed to get that three or so hours in. And then for the next few days, I basically couldn't really function, which is not uncommon. And I just had to resign myself to like, okay, well, I didn't do all my clearing this year for the same reasons. And just, yeah, it's just like I whatever happens happens I got my most valuable stuff and you know that's always interesting to to run around and think like what's valuable to me what do you grab just because it's worth money so you can sell it off if you need to to you know after you lose everything and what's of real value and real sentimental value what can you replace what can't you replace all that kind of stuff after that I got you know after the danger was pretty much over and I'd torn my life upside down in a couple of sessions like because a couple of days later i went through and packed some more valuables and stuff and then i had to put my life back together so instead of just throwing everything back where it was i started to try to get my life together here and, and more organized if things go well and poisoning myself with frogs works <laughs> um I have a space that i'm going to try to turn into a blacksmith shop it's just a small like eight by ten shed here which is great, that's that's plenty big for me. And I have all the equipment, it's just a matter of getting it out and getting it set up. So hopefully that'll happen. You know, the way things have gone for the last 20 years, what would happen is I'd get it set up and then never really have the you know, energy to use it, basically. That, that's really the truth. But I'm gonna try to do that and uh, try to get my life a little more organized. And I wanna move out of here and move into this other building, but that's like a big project. None of that's gonna happen unless I feel better. And let's just hope the frog poison will be the thing. You know, a lot of things have helped me a little bit or they've helped for a short amount of time. But honestly, when you, when I hear other people talk about this and how they use it traditionally, it sounds tailor fit for my problems, which is like, you know, hard to pin down exactly what's wrong. You know, there's really nothing to treat. Um, you could say, oh, you have Lyme disease. Well, you should treat that. Well, I've treated that, you know, in many different ways. And I actually improved when I stopped trying to treat it. So that's that's bogus. I, I think Lyme disease is a red herring and that's that's another conversation. But so hopefully that'll work. I, you know, I'm, I'm cynical about it, but at the same time I'm hopeful and I'm actually excited about it, which I haven't been really excited about a treatment for for quite a while. Point being that it's just going to be me limping along on this roller coaster until I, I can feel better and I'm only going to be able to get so much done, which is really frustrating because I'm like an idea machine and I'm constantly dreaming up these ideas, but as soon as I get some momentum, it's like boom, like a brick wall just comes up and I hit it and slide down like a wily e. Coyote and then I'm down for the count for a while and I can't function. And that includes like writing. Um, sometimes I can write and edit and do stuff and do research and other times I can't do anything. So hopefully, thumbs crossed. <laughs> Later.